Hey everybody and welcome to this, my first of two videos on the Nikon FG20. The Nikon FG20 is an entry-level interchangeable lens SLR and that just means that uh, interchangeable lens simply means that the lens here can be taken off of the camera at any point when you're not taking a picture and the film won't be ruined by it. It has a center-weighted meter. What that means is that if you were looking through the Nikon FG20 at this scene, what's inside this box I'm making with my fingers is the majority of the metering information. About 60%, I believe, on most Nikons, and then 40% would come from everything that's around it. That means that if you have something really bright here, uh, what's around it will be somewhat darker than it actually is. But it also means that if you're taking a picture of a, a, picture of a person and you put their face in the center of the frame, then you're going to have a better chance of properly exposing for their face. It has shutter speeds of one second up to one one thousandth of a second. The viewfinder has 0.84x magnification, meaning that it, what you see in here is 84% of the size of what comes through the lens. And it has 92% frame coverage, meaning that if what you were seeing right now is what you saw through the viewfinder of your FG20, then 8% of what is on the film is not visible to you. And that means that about 4% um, or so, give or take on the top, bottom, and sides, is gonna be on the film, but not in your viewfinder. That's, an, that's advantageous later on when it comes to cropping your negatives. It gives you a little bit of leeway to do that. It has a fixed focusing screen with a split ring viewfinder. For Nikon fans, uh, if you're familiar with Nikon viewfinders, this uses the K2 screen from the FE, but it's not interchangeable. So it has a very nice viewfinder that a lot of people really like. And then the flash sync on this camera is 1 60th of a second, which you can see here marked in red. So as I mentioned, this was an entry-level camera, and is entry-level not due to functions, it's very functional, and has, it can basically do anything, and it's got a lot of nice bells and whistles on it um, that were not even thought of for professional cameras 15, 20 years before this came out. The build quality on it is one of the big things it gives away, that it's an entry-level camera. It, it's not weather-sealed, obviously, it's fairly lightweight, and a lot of the pieces in it are, are plastic. But being entry-level doesn't mean that it's not capable. And even though it's an entry-level camera, it does have some nice features like that built-in K2 focusing screen. And it has a very good viewfinder considering how small and compact this camera is. And despite being a, um, an entry-level camera, it does have some other nice features like having a manual shutter speed at 1 90th of a second, which means that if you don't have batteries, you can still use the camera. And I believe if you don't have batteries, any of the shutter speeds except auto, nope, even auto, are um, the manual shutter speed. But you can manually select that to, uh, these were made by Nippon Kogaku, which is now the Nikon Corporation, in Tokyo, Japan from 1984 to 1986. It was preceded by the Nikon EM, some sources will tell you that this followed the FG, uh, but Nikon's website for this camera, which was still live as of 2019, refers to this as an upgraded Nikon EM with manual mode. So in Nikon's own words, this followed the EM, not the FG. It was made concurrently with the F3, F301, and F501, and it was followed by nothing directly as Nikon moved away from the manual focus F-mount cameras to the autofocus F-mount cameras. And um, they built on the design interface of different models. And I know there was an entry-level autofocus Nikon. I think it was the, the 2020, not 100% certain which one it was, but it, it's, fun, it's such a different looking camera than this one with such a different interface. I would have a hard time saying that it's directly based on this camera. So as we do, we will go through this camera's features and talk about what all of them are. We start on the top, though technically on the front, these are the camera strap lugs, and this is what you would put your, your camera strap on when you're carrying it around. You'll notice these plastic doodads, these are actually on backwards. They should be on, come on, 
like I'm about to put this one on here. If it'll let me put it back on. There we go. Almost. These plastic doodads should be on this way so that when you have your strap on them, the plastic bits rub up against the, the camera and not the metal, which protects the finish. Over here we have the film rewind knob and lever, and that this also opens the film back here. This is the marked this dial is marked ASA Solidus ISO. Um, this is your film speed, what is now called ISO selection dial. And to adjust it, you simply lift the ring and move the little white dot on it to align with your film speed. That white dot is your film speed indicator index. That symbol right there is your film plane indicator and indicates where the film is aligned. Flash hot shoe. This white line here is your shutter speed index. This silver button here is your auto mode lock unlock button. As you see in auto mode, I can't remove it from auto mode. Or auto mode with beep, I can't remove it from auto mode without pushing down that button. But in any of the manual modes, I can adjust it without hitting the unlock. Shutter release, film advance lever, frame count window. On the front of the camera, we have the self timer right here. And the way that works is that you arm it, wrong way. And then after you arm the self timer, you push the shutter button, the mirror flips up, which prevents mirror shake um, at the time of the exposure. And then it takes the picture after the self timer is finished and then you advance the camera and go. The self timer will only is clockwork, so you have to wind it up in order for it to work. This is the lens mount here. Uh, this is the lens mount, the lens release button right here. This is your metering index couple. This, this connects to the lens right here to allow it, the camera to, to know what the, the meter reading is. Because this is fixed, if you have NAI or pre-AI lenses, they're called, which are older Nikon lenses that don't automatically index, they will not mount on this camera without damaging your camera. You can tell them because this lens, which is an automatic, automatically indexing lens, has a notch cut out here and a notch cut out here. On the older lenses that cannot mount, the whole bottom is smooth. So if you have raised areas on your lens mount, this lens can use them. If the bottom is smooth, this, this camera cannot use them. Here's the lens mounting index, and here is the exposure value compensation button right here. On the back of the camera, we have the viewfinder window and the film memo holder. On the bottom, we have the, the, the motor drive electronic contacts, the battery uh, chamber, made in Japan, tripod bushing. Here we have the film rewind button and the mechanical connection for the film advance. Also on the back we have the um, serial, serial number, by the way, in the memo holder. Inside the camera, film cassette chamber. Then we have these four silver rails here. These are uh, film guide rails. We'll see how these work in video two. The outside prevent the film from moving up and down as it travels through the camera. And the inside ones sandwich up against this film pressure plate to keep the film flat so that the lens will focus the image in the correct place. This is the film advance sprocket. And what this does is it doesn't spin backwards. So the film sprocket holes loop into here, and then this prevents the film from being pulled back into the film cassette by the spring memory built into the film through months or years of sitting in that cassette. This is the film take-up spool. And when you advance the film, these two guys work together to keep the film moving forward and being pulled into the take-up spool smoothly. We saw the film pressure plate here that keeps pressure on the film. And then this little spring right here fits over the cassette here to keep it lined up so that the film comes out of it smoothly and correctly. When you rewind the film, I said that this doesn't move freely, it only moves forward and only when you advance the film. When you press the film rewind re release button, now this spins freely so you can rewind the film without damaging anything in the camera or the film itself. So some things not to do with your camera. Don't store the camera with the shutter ready to fire. Anytime you're gonna store it, 
you want to trigger the shutter. If you're done for the day, even if you have a roll of film in it and you're going to set it aside, I do it even if it's just overnight, but definitely for a few days or a week. It's better to sacrifice that one frame and tri trip the shutter. The reason for that is because the shutter has a bunch of springs in it and they're under tension waiting for the shutter to be fired. So if you let it sit for days or months or whatever, with the tension on those springs, they'll start to develop a memory and then they, they won't work as well. Your timing will be off or your shutter won't work. So um, when you are using these cameras, when you're done with them for the day, make sure to trip your shutter. Also, don't touch the shutter when you have the film back open and when you have the lens off, don't touch the mirror. Touching the shutter is a really good way to brick it because if you put your finger in the shutter or you push the, the leaves out of alignment, you can damage them and even the oil on your fingers can leave a mark on the shutter which can impair their functionality. With the mirror, the oils on your fingers can cause it to tarnish which can, which can hamper your ability to focus but it can also throw off your metering. So you don't want to touch the mirror if, um, unless you do it by accident, but you don't seriously try not to do that. Don't leave your camera or lenses in your car. The heat in your car in the summer can cause the oils in them to get very thin and get to places they shouldn't be, like onto the aperture leaves or into the mechanism in places they shouldn't be in the camera. And when they get back to their proper viscosity, when they cool down, then things aren't going to work properly. Oil on aperture leaves especially can cause them to, to malfunction and, and not work correctly. Same thing in the cold. With very cold weather will cause the oils to break down and become thick and gummy. And that can ruin the viscosity and the, the functionality of your camera as well. And lastly, just from a practical standpoint, even if you pop out of your car for like, I don't know, five minutes just to use the bathroom at the rest area or something, take your camera gear with you because a camera thief just sees an opportunity. They don't see an entry level camera. So take your camera with you because, it's, because leaving your camera in your car is a way to come back to no camera and a broken window. It's always better to have a camera and no broken window. Don't let your camera get wet because it's not weather sealed and water can short out the electronics or cause some of the metal components in this to rust. Also, don't store this in a plastic bag or box unless you have a rechargeable desiccant pack that you can pop in the oven when it turns a certain color to recharge it. Just remember your Nikon FG20 is a precision instrument. As long as you take care of your camera, your camera will take care of you. So that's it for the first of these two videos on the Nikon FG20. If this video was helpful, please give me a thumbs up. That lets me know that I'm producing content which is helpful and useful to you. If you have any questions, please leave those below. And I do my best to check comments and questions every day or two and answer those. If you have suggestions or ideas for future videos, please leave those below. And if I have the ability and knowledge and equipment, I'm happy to do that. Much of what you see in these videos now is based on comments and questions that you guys have left that have allowed me to improve the videos that I make for this channel. One last thing. Thank you everyone very much for watching and I'll see you in video two.